the live. All right, commissioners, we are live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the December 1st, 2021 meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission for the City of Asheville. My name is Joe Archibald. I'm the current chair of the commission. All the commission members, staff, and applicants are participating virtually, and we appreciate your patience during this time of virtual meetings. This meeting is being streamed live on the city's virtual engagement hub, a link of which can be found on the homepage for, of the city's website and on the Planning and Zoning Commission's webpage. In addition, you can watch past meetings on the city's YouTube channel. The Planning and Zoning Commission accepts public comments on items that are listed on the agenda in a variety of ways. Email and recorded comments are accepted until 5 p.m. the day prior to the meeting and live comments during this meeting are accepted by calling 855-925-2801 and using the code 9273. All of this information is listed on the Planning and Zoning Commission's website for future reference. Please note that all comments that are received prior to the meeting are shared with all commission members. However, they may not be read aloud during the meeting. We make every attempt to address any and all comments received during our, our discussion of the particular agenda item for which we receive comments. Uh, we will begin this evening's meeting with roll call. Ms. Tuck. All right, uh, Chair Archibald. Here. Vice Chair Levi. Present. Commissioner Hoke. Here. Commissioner Faircloth. Here. Commissioner Bubenik. Here. Commissioner Simmons. Here. Commissioner Barton. Here. And let's see, have I missed anybody? I think that's everybody. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have a quorum. Great. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So the first item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes from the November 3rd, 2021 meeting. Uh, is there any discussion? Does anybody have any comments on those? And if not, I'll take a motion to approve or disprove. Make a motion to approve the minutes. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I'll do a roll call vote. When I do, if you can just uh, say aye and raise your hand or nay. Uh, Vice Chair Levi. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Hoke. Aye. Commissioner Barton. Aye. Commissioner Simmons. Aye. Commissioner Bubenik. Aye. And Commissioner Faircloth. Aye. And I will vote aye as well. So the motion passes unanimously. The next item on the agenda. So we have two items that we will be postponing until date certain of January 1st, excuse me, January 5th, 2022. Those are a request to rezone two city-owned parcels uh, located at 285 Livingston Street and 415 South French Broad Avenue. Uh, the other item that is being postponed is the zoning text amendment to chapter seven of the Unified Development Ordinance to update the open space requirements. Again, both of these are being postponed until our next meeting, which is January 5th of 2022. With those two removed from our agenda, we'll proceed to the first legislative public hearing, which is a request to conditionally rezone the property located at 235 Sardis Road from commercial industrial to residential expansion conditional zone. Property is identified as pin 9627018639 in the Buncombe County tax record. 
property owner is WS Investments LLC, and the project contact is Mike Anderson. Planner coordinating, coordinating review is Shannon Tuck. Ms. Tuck. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. So as uh, Mr. Archibald has indicated, this first item on your agenda is a conditional zoning request for the property located at 235 Sardis Road. Oops. Um, the subject property is outlined here in red. These are SNPs from your two Exhibit A maps, the Exhibit A, uh, which is the existing zoning, and then Exhibit A1, which is the proposed zoning. As I mentioned, this is a conditional zoning or a rezoning request for the subject property located off of Sardis Road. It's a fairly large parcel, a little over 22 acres in total. Um, and you can see that there are these, it's sort of unusually shaped and it has these kind of arms or tentacles that sort of reach out to Sardis Road. And it's through this road frontage that the, the development gains um, access. Uh, but the bulk of the development will be located towards the rear of the property. And the rezoning request is for the purpose of constructing a large multifamily apartment community. So the request is to rezone the property from its existing designation of commercial industrial or abbreviated CI to residential expansion conditional zone. Because the project includes over 50 residential units, um, the uh, unified, the city's unified development ordinance requires a rezoning to one of the city's expansion districts. So residential expansion is the most appropriate designation. Just as the there is a request to rezone the property or to change the zoning designation, should that be supported, we have to examine the city's future land use map and see whether or not the existing future land use designation is appropriate. So the existing land use designation is industrial manufacturing. So that is all of that area that's in purple or the darker purple. And given the nature of this proposal being a uh, multifamily residential community, we would uh, recommend that the designation be changed to residential neighborhood um, should this request be supported. I would just like to point out, you see to the left that this, the Sardis Road area, if you're not very familiar with it, um, this area kind of ties into the Sand Hill area. It was historically a very industrial part of the city. And over time, this area is kind of transitioning from that sort of heavy industry to uh, there is still a little bit of industry in the area, but it's lighter industry or more commercial in nature. And we're also seeing some of these properties turn over um, for residential purposes or other uses that support residential. So that employment anchor institution designation to the west of the subject property actually represents the Franklin School of Innovation. And some of these, some of you uh, may remember the Franklin School of Innovation coming before the commission. Um, for its conditional zoning request. So um, you, you, again, we're starting to see more and more residential, more and more uses that are in support of residential, such as the school. So a change to the future land use map is, is appropriate. Before we look at the site plan, I like to look at the existing conditions. So you can see that the property is currently undeveloped and vacant. Um, you'll notice that to the north is a uh, jurisdictional water, that's Hominy Creek. Hominy Creek is one of Asheville's more significant creeks. Um, it has a good bit of water. It has its own floodway and floodplain, so it's, it's fairly significant body of water. You can see two tributaries, too, sort of in the center of the site that come together and feed into Hominy Creek. Um, there is an existing culvert that allows for a crossing over that tributary, and it essentially sort of bisects the property to two sides, the east and west sides. Um, again, you can see those um, sort of those arms of the property that reach out to Sardis Road. This is where the property will gain access into the development. Um, this is the site plan for the proposal. It's I realize at this scale, it's a little bit hard to kind of read the detail. I'm going to zoom in in a moment. But um, just to see the entire master plan, it's in its totality. The project is um, uh, proposing six fairly large multifamily apartment buildings, and these buildings will be built in two phases. 
Uh, in total, it will include 297 residential units, um, a clubhouse, some accessory structures such as um, garage, storage garages, walking trails, and other typical amenities that you find in um, apartment communities such as this. Um, there are three vehicular access points into the property. You see to the south of the site, you've got two vehicular access points coming from Sardis Road or that come directly off of Sardis Road. There is a third located here. Let's see, you can see my cursor. Um, on the uh, west side, that actually connects to a, an existing private road that's known as Innovation Drive. And that is the private road that primarily, at least today, supports the Franklin School of Innovation and provides egress out to Sardis Road. So that would be another access point for this development. Um, also included in the project is a large number of surface parking spaces, 437 spaces. Uh, there is a, a fairly robust sidewalk network that is proposed. Um, there are small sidewalk sections along Sardis Road, but the majority of the sidewalk really connects the project um, internally and to Sardis Road. Residential expansion requires 10 foot wide uh, sidewalks throughout. Um, however, it's not unusual for large communities like this to propose sort of a, a hierarchy of sidewalks. So uh, the, uh, the main arteries kind of into the property and across to the two phases propose 10 foot wide sidewalks. And then it drops down to six foot wide sidewalks for some of the other sort of more secondary connections. 10% um, or 30 units are being set aside as affordable, meeting the city's affordable standards um, of 80%, being affordable to those earning 80% AMI for a minimum period of 20 years. And then lastly, this is a rezoning for a portion of this property. It is not the entire parcel. There is one small, a uh, little less than an acre piece located here um, on Sardis Road that is proposed to be excluded from the rezoning. It will re retain the existing commercial industrial um, designation, which would allow for some, some commercial uses potentially in the future. It, it is a rezoning for the large majority of the property, but it is nevertheless not the entire property. So we describe it as a portion of pin number XXX. So to zoom in just, oops, just a little bit, you can see I've kind of zoomed in on the body of where the, the apartment um, construction will occur. And you can see those two phases. It, the property is essentially bifurcated by that tributary that feeds into Hominy Creek. So you have phase one on the west side, and that includes four of the six buildings, um, as well as uh, 263 parking spaces in addition to the clubhouse. And then phase two on the east side, buildings five and six, 105 units, 174 parking spaces, and those on-site garage storage units. So those um, are located here, sort of on the south end of phase two. Um, so it's nice to have a little um, on-site storage for uh, residents. The applicant has also included some building elevations. There are two types of buildings proposed. They are both the same number of stories. They're both four-story buildings, 43 feet in height. Uh, we measure height from the main point of entry at the front door or the fire department access to the ceiling of the highest occupiable floor. So that results in a height of 43 feet. Um, overall, the applicant has provided dimension of a little over 53 feet. And that is to the very top of this um, sort of tower feature or parapet. So the overall height has an appearance of being 53 feet, but how we actually calculate is 43 feet. This building is <clears throat> also quite long. It's 250 feet long. And you can see um, from this front elevation, there is one primary entrance from the rear, uh, very similar in character. Um, and then from the side, you have two additional entrances to allow access in and out of the apartment building. 
The second building types, very similar in character and design as the first building type. Again, same height, same number of stories, but it is shorter. It's only um, 170 feet long. And there's only one of the six buildings that is this particular building type, this shorter or um, not as long building type. And you can see again, a single primary entrance, um, very similar in character from the rear. And then again, very similar to the previous building elevations for those side elevations and entrances. Um, all of our conditional zonings come with a list of project conditions that uh, describe the features of the project. We also like to identify the any exceptions or technical modifications to our development standards. The only one in this case is the request to reduce some of the sidewalks from 10 feet to 6 feet. Um, we like to uh, certainly identify the number of residential units and whether or not any are affordable, which has been outlined and detailed in that list of project conditions. This project also includes uh, some walking trails and the preservation of green space. Uh, one thing that I do appreciate about this project is it has relatively minimal impact on those jurisdictional waters and preserves them as sort of an amenity. Um, they're not, they're only piping the crossing um, for the stream and not um, pipe, you know, we see other development projects that pipe streams and put parking lots on top. So the, the streams are remaining daylighted um, and particularly Hominy Creek is being highlighted as an amenity to the development. There are uh, good internal connections between the two sides, particularly given that they are separated by this tributary. Uh, and it does, the proposal, the entrance driveways into the property are wide enough and um, the applicant has agreed to include sharrows for um, multimodal access. Uh, and then um, most of our development projects or conditional zonings include a two-year approval period. So this rezoning, should it be approved, would be valid for two years um, during which the applicant has um, that approval amount of time to obtain their zoning and apply for their building permits. And then lastly, uh, the size of this project did require a traffic impact analysis that is currently in review by the NCDOT. We have some preliminary recommendations that were uh, highlighted in your staff report. The applicant has indicated that they are comfortable complying with those recommendations, um, just subject to the NCDOT um, approving any of those uh, off-site improvements. And that concludes my summary of the project. Uh, we do recommend approval of this conditional zoning subject to those conditions and any um, outstanding issues related to the technical review committee report. Be happy to answer any questions. I know the applicant and their team are present as well if there are any questions for the applicant. Thank you, Ms. Tuck. Um, do any of the commissioners have any questions right now uh, for staff? Uh, yes, Ms. Bubinick. Uh, this is a question and a concern as far as the sidewalks go, because what I'm seeing throughout the town and the county is when a new project gets built, they are building the sidewalks, which is great, um, but the older projects, um, like don't have sidewalks. So there's no like connection for the um, new people to like walk. So basically the, they're walking on the sidewalk in front of their new building and maybe they want to go to Ingalls or you know the mall or wherever, but then like the sidewalk just drops off. So how are we going to be holding um, like the older projects accountable? Because uh, especially like in this area where there's a lot of like older commercial um, places that may stay there forever, uh, and so they may not ever have to be held accountable to build a sidewalk. Um, you know, what is our plan moving forward for that? Well, every year the city sets aside money for um, capital improvements or city improvements. And there's there, our sidewalk um, fund gets replenished um, to some degree every year. So there there is a long list of sidewalk improvement projects that the city sort of incrementally tackles as funds become available. Uh, when we have more sidewalk connections, like the more of the, as these projects sort of build out more and more, and you know, while we may not have a continuous 
sidewalk in all areas as we get these different segments and the more segments we get makes these infill segments um, higher priorities. So um, certain areas that might develop a little bit faster over time or have greater you know, populations of people moving into the area, um, those are likely to get built out a little bit sooner just because there's greater demand. And then eventually though, it should all fill in. We also have recently strengthened our sidewalk requirements so that it's a little bit more difficult for an applicant to avoid um, building their sidewalk. And we have also strengthened and increased the opportunity for applicants to pay a fee in lieu. So that's relatively new. So if you happen to be in an area where it's very low volume or you have other physical constraints that make it impossible for you to build a sidewalk, you can pay a fee and those sidewalk funds get added to the pot and get uh, spent in the area from where those funds came. So it's, it's true that we will have sidewalks that are not continuous in all areas, but over time, eventually, they should um, eventually all get connected. Thank you. Commissioner Faircloth, you got a question, comment? Um, hey, commissioners and uh, Shannon and uh, presenters. Um, I guess my big concern here is the amount of impervious surfaces and the stormwater management. And I'm sure that's part of the the review process. And I'm sure that's part of the development process. Um, just being so close to a tributary and so close to French Broad um, and having personal issues or biases against stormwater management. I, I would just like to hear from the developer or um, the reviewers on what their plan is for for those issues. I'll, I'll let the um, the development team and I think they could probably address that a little bit better than I could. And on that specific question, uh, the impervious uh, uh, surface numbers that were in the application are incorrect. There's been a revised sheet with correct numbers. Um, we've got tons of, of open space and uh, that kind of impervious calculation is gonna be an issue at all on this uh, on this property. So uh, if that hasn't already been sent over to, to staff, uh, we'll make sure that happens uh, while this, this hearing's going on. I can confirm that the project does meet their impervious surface requirement. Um, it's not to say that Having additional impervious pervious space spaces isn't a benefit, but it does meet the technical requirements for that. Um, Stormwater and flood protection; those are also technical standards that are examined during the technical review process. And um, that the you know this project was approved with conditions, so it either complies or has demonstrated the ability to comply with all of those requirements. Um, but I think Mr. Anderson is here. He may be able to speak a little bit more specifically about their stormwater management plans. Uh, thank you, Ms. Tuck and Mr. Swords and presenters. Uh, I, I, I realize it does meet the technical requirements. I, I still have concerns. So I'd, I'd love to hear from the applicant uh, what the plan is and what their, um, what their precautions are going to be. Thank you, though. And we can certainly, yeah, we'll certainly let the give the applicant a chance to uh, to comment on that. And and Mr. Allen, I'll just note that your screen name does not have your correct name. So in case anybody wonders, Jesse Swords is Derek Allen. Um, so yeah, uh, Commissioner Barton, you had a question or comment? Yes, thank you, Chair Archibald. Um, Two, two questions. One, just to add a little bit more specificity to Commissioner Faircloth's uh, question and concern. You know, I, I think in looking at the stormwater plans, there's some underground um, detention areas planned, and it seems like I'm sure that they're calculated as suitable for the, you know, end development. But being a multi-phase development with a tributary splitting the middle, there's going to be a long period of time when this is under construction and protecting the waterways during construction, I think, is something that we all need to be um, you know, more and more cognizant of. So I'd, I'd love to hear details from the applicant of how, not just are we going to satisfy the stormwater requirement at the completion of the project, but during construction specifically, what measures and precautions are gonna be taking, taken to um, 
you know, ensure that, you know, silt fences are maintained properly to protect the waterways. Um, aside from the stormwater question, I, I this is maybe a question for staff. Um, I'm just curious, I know that in the past when large parcels that were zoned commercial industrial are proposed for a, an, a new use and a rezoning, the Economic Development Coalition has been consulted, but did that happen in this case and or have they weighed in on the loss of industrial property? So we have two different designations. We have industrial and commercial industrial, and it's anticipated that commercial industrial will include non-industrial uses. Um, there are more commercial uses than industrial uses in commercial industrial overall. Um, our former comprehensive plan had uh, discouraged the rezoning or the loss of industrial properties. Uh, and that is, you know, when we started the practice of consulting with the Economic Development Coalition um, about the loss of those industrial zoned lands. Uh, the new comprehensive plan doesn't emphasize that as much. It contemplates moving towards a more green industry or a more lighter industrial, um, lighter industry industry. Um, and 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 since this was commercial industrial property, we did not consult with the coalition. Thank you, Thank you. Commissioner. Are you, do you have anything else, Commissioner Barton? Sorry. Okay. Thanks. Um, just a couple before I open it up for the applicant to present. Um, I'll, I'll list a couple of questions. Hopefully, you can or the applicant can address. I was curious, unless unless staff has a has an answer for this. Um, Ms. Tuck, you mentioned um, that you know the way the kind of fingers of the property came down. I know that you know looking at the site plan, it appears that there is another parcel that that driveway B crosses over, um, but it is not part of the rezoning. I was just kind of curious what the, yeah, it's that part that's not in the red. So right I, I was kind of curious, and again, this is probably more a question for the applicant, what the future, their future thoughts are of that, since it does, at least from my reading of these site plans, appear that that driveway B is on that parcel. Um, Let me, um, I'll take a stab at answering that and then I'll invite the applicant to add okay. more yeah. information. So just to clarify, this parcel is not included in the rezoning. This is owned by another entity. The applicant includes it in their development application because obviously their driveway crosses it. So they're obtaining an easement from this adjacent property owner for this driveway. So this property will remain commercial industrial um, and uh, it, it's just going to accommodate this additional access into the property. Okay, that's kind of what I figured. When I was looking at the kind of the grading plan, it appeared that there was grading happening there too. But again, I'll, I'll kind of let the applicant maybe go into further detail about that when we get to that. So, And that can occur. You can have yeah. off-site improvements or easements for access um, across other property and not included in the rezoning or included in other development applications because this property itself is not being developed with a multifamily apartment use. If the apartment buildings were located in this parcel, yes, we would include it in the rezoning, but um, since it's just that the easement for that um, uh, driveway B, uh, it wasn't necessary. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's uh, kind of what I figured. It, again, it was one of those that looked like some things were happening. I just wasn't sure if they already had potential, you know, plans for that or not. So, um, uh, Commissioner Simmons, you had comments, questions. Yes, thank you. So I am curious in terms of the number of units dedicated to being affordable. Um, is there an opportunity to encourage increasing the amount of affordable units provided? I'll let the applicant respond to that. And Commissioner Hoke, you had a question or comment? I was on the same terms. Was was that 10% or 30 units at the minimum of um, what is um, required by the city? And, and also the same as Ms. Uh, Ms. Simmons mentioned, and I'm um, adding more um, affordable units. 
There, there is no specified minimum or maximum. It's, it's not a development requirement to include affordable housing. What is required of a conditional zoning is that they demonstrate support and compliance with the city's comprehensive plan. And affordable housing is just sort of a front and center goal in our comprehensive plan. So for a residential project, it's, um, it's, it's a very strong way to demonstrate support and compliance with the plan. So um, it's not unusual to see that in these large residential projects, but it's not a technical requirement. And so it's really whatever the applicant offers. It's, it's what they've proposed to include and that is those list of project conditions, those actually come from the applicant, not from staff. So that is what they've committed to. And if the commission feels that it's appropriate or necessary to have more in order to demonstrate that compliance, that's something that can be discussed with the applicant. Yeah, and, and I, correct me if, if you know the exact timing of this, Shannon, it seems like it was about two years ago that city council kind of put you know again it's not a requirement but their desire was to have what's called in shorthand 20 80 20 20 percent of the units at 80 percent ami for 20 years as as what they would like to see residential projects do um, again it's not a requirement um, and it is any of the conditions certainly are if if there is something that that this commission and or even once a project like this goes to city council, um, if they find or feel like there's something they would like added to those conditions, if it can be agreed upon with the developer, then then those can be written in. So um, Commissioner Barton, you had a, a question or a comment? Yes, thank you, Chair Archibald. Uh, just to build on the questions of Commissioner Simmons and Hope, um, I'm curious if the applicant would be willing to speak to the um, willingness to accept Section 8 in the affordable units. Um, so I look forward to hearing about that. Okay. Uh, and Commissioner Levi? Did we? I think you're muted. I had a question about the some of the apartment buildings being in the hundred year flood. And I was wondering, um, it looked like some of the elevations had quite a bit of fenestration on those levels. Um, do we know if stormwater is requiring um, any sort of barriers or change to type of construction that's not maybe documented on these drawings? Again, I'll have the applicant respond to that. Okay. Um, if there aren't any other immediate questions right now, let's go ahead and, and have the applicant do their presentation. And certainly we can, can take some more time to ask them questions. But this hopefully this will give you some, some opportunity to address some of those questions. So uh, I believe um, Mr. Anderson, are you going to be presenting or Mr. Allen? Uh, I'll, I'll start out. Uh, thanks very much uh, to the staff. Thanks very much uh, to, to everyone for their time on this. Um, and I'll kind of address the, the bigger points and then let uh, Mike Anderson, who's our engineer on this project, get into a lot of the technical questions that are being asked about specifics on the project. Um, this property uh, obviously is in this industrial uh, area that has started to change. Uh, there's a school that's next door. There's single family residential. Uh, across the, uh, the green area and adjacent to this property. Um, we believe that this kind of multifamily residential project in between uh, the road, in between the school and into those single family detached dwellings uh, is a nice uh, way to taper that development out. Um, we also want to recognize that uh, providing housing stock in our area is of the utmost importance. Um, uh, I, th I think Shannon saw some of the things that we had presented recently on an affordable housing presentation uh, that my firm did with uh, the chamber um, at a recent policy event and Paul D'Angelo was speaking. And, and during that, we talked about uh, the lag time that it takes to get a project through planning and zoning, neighborhood meetings, TRC, uh, city council, post city council. 
um, from the time that we put one of those applications in for clients like this to the time that dirt's being moved is a period of about 12 or 13 months. Uh, that's not even including the build out time. So we're, we're trying to get these things through uh, as a development community and, and, and this part's an important part of that, that process, but, but we are doing that and recognize that. And these, these, these folks that are put this development together, get it, um, which is why they're trying to, to put a project in the right area that's close to jobs, that's close to schools, uh, fits with the city's master plan uh, and does provide that housing stock. In addition, and without being asked, they have uh, added in this 10% affordable housing requirement at 80% AMI. Um, Mr. Archibald had talked about this 2080-20. That 2080-20 is most often seen uh, when you are uh, requesting from the city Luigi grants, which on average ends up being about $80,000 that the city gives in tax rebates uh, to a project like this to do it. Um, we're not asking for those. It's, this developer has, has not asked for those. And so the number is not 20% of the affordable housing, uh, uh, the units being dedicated to affordable housing, rather 10% of the affordable housing. And that's all on the back of, of this developer with no city involvement. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, putting that kind of commitment out uh, is, is a big deal. Um, it's expensive to build uh, these kinds of units. It gets more expensive every time uh, we get new materials in, they're coming in. Uh, we hear about how expensive things are to develop and to develop those and to dedicate those for affordable housing is a big deal and so just to say uh you know can you do more here um just because we need them in the community is not terribly fair to individual developers uh when these folks are, are at go ahead and putting in that that 10 percent commitment from the beginning in addition to the 80 percent ami they're agreeing to uh deed restrict that property for a period of 20 years. Uh, so those affordable units don't go away. Um, they're there at that 80% AMI for 20 years and the city prepares uh, a deed restriction that we agree to include as part of our conditions and put into, into this project. Uh, this project is a, it's a big lick for affordable housing, but also uh, it's a lot of uh, units that are going in at a time when we need them in our community. This project will be built out over two phases, and I'll let Mike talk a lot about the, the phasing there. Um, but as we've gone through this project, we've looked at a couple of different things. The first thing was the city's master plan to make sure that we're doing something that made sense. The second is in this community, does it make sense? Are we putting the right things in place? Um, in addition to that, we've looked at uh, what the TRC comments were as we went through staff TRC and every single thing that staff recommended uh, as a condition we put in. And then when planning and zoning staff took their final uh, edits and suggested conditions to us, we've adopted all of those as our own and are uh, offering up those as conditions. Um, this afternoon, Shannon and I were working through uh, fine tuning those. Uh, we are about 98% of the way there. Uh, we don't have any objections uh, to what we have put forth as our intended conditions with this project. Uh, those intended conditions include considerable open space. Uh, it will be the greater of 15%. Uh, of the project area, uh, or uh, it will be 500 square feet per unit, whichever is greater, we will do uh, that. So it's, it's going to be somewhere between 140,000 square feet and 150,000 square feet of dedicated uh, open space. We've got an extensive trail system uh, and we've ag agreed to extensive landscaping pieces. Um, I'd like to go ahead and, and, and pull Mike Anderson on to start to address some of these specific questions dealing with uh, impervious area, uh, both after construction and during construction, as well as the fenestration piece. Mike, are you available to, to jump on now? I sure am. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm Mike Anderson with Advantage Civil Engineering. Uh, we're the engineer of record uh, for the development. Um, so it, I would like to uh, just talk about a couple of the, uh, the highlights and, and, and this will lead into answering some of the questions that were raised earlier. Uh, in addition to doing the uh, affordable units, adding things like uh, the bike lanes, building greenways along Omni Creek, those are all things that allow for people to travel safely within the community over time. You know, we, we know that uh, greenways and sidewalks don't get built overnight very often, but this, this will give a, um, a you know, uh, some pretty major connections. We have a lot of frontage along Hominy Creek specifically. And so to have um, additional ways to travel in the future as our community grows, 
uh, we, we see that as a huge benefit. And that's, uh, one of the things that, um, my, my clients and, um, have, have encouraged us to include, uh, throughout this whole process. You know, right now, Sardis Road probably isn't the most comfortable way to, um, travel by bike within the city of Asheville. But over time, as, you know, DOT does road improvement projects, as additional projects get developed, uh, you start to build those connections. Um, from an environmental standpoint, um, on the uh, unnamed tributary and also along portions of the Hominy Creek, there's some pretty severe uh, stream bank erosion um, in that tributary um, in that northern section before you hit Hominy. There's vertical slopes of, you know, in excess of 20 feet in some areas. And so uh, what we're wanting to do as part of our project is to uh, put in the effort to stabilize those stream channels and stream banks and beautify those areas um, for uh, not just for the environmental um, uh, equality that that will provide, but it also um, provide an amenity to the residents in that area. Um, from an impervious standpoint, uh, the maximum allowed impervious area uh, in, in this district would be 80% impervious. Uh, we're hovering around the 40% impervious. So, uh, you know, significantly lower than what the maximum would be allowed in that area. Um, stormwater controls will like, or, or they're going to be pretty much have to be all underground. Um, and that's due to uh, the odd configuration of the property and the fact that we have so much water and floodplain. So um, on those streams, after we stabilize those, those will have 30 foot. Uh, buffers on each side of the stream and along Hominy. Um, and there's a, a floodway line and, and we really need to stay out of that floodway. Floodway is considered the critical flow path for flooding events. So we don't want to put stormwater controls in those areas or, uh, or, or have major impacts to the elevations of the ground in that area. And so when you're providing the parking and you have these buildings, it, it, it really limits our ability to do stormwater um, any place other than underground. So that that's our preferred tool for a project like this. Um, when you look at uh, the, the grading plans, we will have a phase grading plan and we'll work with city staff to have that approved. Uh, it, we don't like to see the entire property opened up at one time uh, during grading activities because it does get to be more difficult to manage. So we'll try to phase our dirt moving, stabilize ground, get permanent ground cover as much as we can before we uh, you know, move on to other areas and, and do that dirt moving. We included the adjacent property uh, as part of our agreement and getting um, our easement for our secondary access. Uh, we negotiated with them and we're going to provide them some buildable pads so that they can uh, do their applications and have future, you know, uh, development plans. We don't, I don't think that those have been developed or considered very far just yet, but we are making some uh, provisions as part of our um, agreements with them. Um, Let's see here. Oh, also as part of uh, our grading and erosion control permit, uh, there will be a requirement for biweekly inspections and also um, inspections after any um, significant rainfall events, say, you know, essentially an inch of rainfall or more. Uh, those inspections include going around to every uh, erosion control measure, making sure that they're working properly if they're not working properly to, to do those repairs immediately so that, so that uh, everything is in good shape before the next rainfall event. Um, let's see here. Uh, as far as the, the floodplain goes, there is a significant amount of area on the property that is within the 100-year floodplain. Um, our, what we are going to be doing is uh, raising the elevations, the finished floor elevations of those buildings two feet a minimum of two feet above uh, the flood elevation. And so that will provide protection to those uh, structures. Um, as part of that permit process, we work with FEMA to revise the flood maps and to relocate the floodplain lines so that, um, so that as uh, FEMA does their modeling moving into the future, their maps are updated and they're 
aware that we have structures here. Um, the structures would be outside of those floodplain areas. Um, and, you know, residents are essentially protected that way. Um, you know, it's important that we're protecting both public safety and also um, the, the value of the structures and the land. Um, and that the, the flood permitting not only goes through FEMA, but it also uh, um, is handled by a local administrator who's an employee of the city of Asheville. Um, traffic study. Uh, traffic study uh, came back and uh, we're working with DOT to make sure that uh, the recommended um, improvements um, will satisfy them. Uh, when we, when our traffic engineer, who is with us today, so if there's detailed questions, we'll, we'll ask David to speak to those. Uh, they coordinate how the traffic study is done with NCDOT. They determine um, a project study areas. They take into account um, other projects that are approved in the area or going through approval process. And then they also uh, account for growth over time. Um, and in our recommendations, we're going to be doing some uh, signalization improvement uh, at the intersection of Sardis Road and Brevard Road. It's pretty long ways from the project, but uh, the study indicated that that would be helpful to move traffic. Uh, we're going to provide 100 feet of channelized storage within our, um, as you're exiting our property, 100 feet of channelized storage allows for essentially five cars to stack up and, and wait their turn to turn onto Sardis. And we also have a uh, innovation drive that we, we share with the Franklin School of Innovation in our neighborhood meeting. Uh, that was a, a, a topic of uh, discussion. So uh, the school or all schools have to go through an MSTA process, that's their driveway permit process to make sure that they have adequate uh, staging within their property for um, school drop off and pick up of students. Uh, their current permit requires a right turn exit only. Um, our, our recommendation in the TIA is for us to include a left turn out of the property um, before we could agree or have that as a condition. Uh, we'll have to coordinate with the Franklin School of Innovation, make sure that they're on board with that as a want or a need and also make sure that uh, NCDOT is okay with that. Um, it may trigger some um, improvements of traffic movement within the school itself. And again, they, they would need to be a part of that conversation before we did anything. Um, and it's a third entrance for us. So uh, we think we have some flexibility if there's concerns from DOT or the school as far as how that, um, that exit would operate. Um, I think I hit most of the um, questions from a technical standpoint that I heard, but um, I'd love to answer any questions or if I missed anything, I can address those at this time. Mike, can I ask a clarifying question? Um, you mentioned raising the base flood or the buildings two feet above base flood elevation. Is it correct to assume that this elevation doesn't show that it doesn't show the foundation that would raise the building above the base flood. Uh, those buildings are essentially uh, slab on grade construction. So we uh, place the earth material, you know, okay. two to two and a half feet above that base flood, and then they build the uh, the slab foundation on top of the ground and go yeah. vertical from there. Okay, thank you. I've got a couple of questions uh, for you, Mr. Anderson, but Janice, did you have a, a question? I think you're muted. Sorry, I had a quick clarifying question. Mr. Anderson, you mentioned greenways, and I'm looking at the conditions. I see general walking paths and trails. I didn't know if you meant there would be, if this ties into, into a city greenway plan, and if you're um, going to be dedicating any greenway space. I, I just didn't see that listed in the conditions specified. It's not included as a condition of the approval, but um, you'll see on the plan, you can, uh, it's almost a, a, like a figure eight or, uh, you know, the trails are along the um, Pomney Creek and we have the loops to encourage exercise and that sort of uh, activity on the property. And we're building those all the way to our property line so that if there is any future greenway connections that they can tie on 
Um, I don't have a copy of the Greenway master plan with me this evening, but um, we, we know that Hominy Creek has been mm-hmm. um, at least discussed as a, as a priority for potential of future greenways. And these would be eight foot wide paths in that area and uh, ADA accessible for, you know, making those accessible to the public. Okay, so I, yeah, I, I classified these or I characterized them in the conditions as walking trails because our greenway system, you know, would require greenway easements. It would require, I think, wider than eight feet. Um, I didn't think that was this project's intent. So if it was this project's intent to potentially provide easements and walking paths that would support or be part of the city's system, then it might be good to get that clarification. The Greenway Master Plan actually shows the alignment on the opposite side of the creek. So um, I, I had assumed, and pr- probably should have checked with you further, Mike, that this might connect to that system in the future, but not necessarily be part of the system. That, that's you're, you're correct. We were not okay. intending it to be like a formal connection point, but the, the idea was that it would work together. Very good. Okay. A um, couple of questions, Mr. Anderson. Um, you mentioned, I'll go for the first one that you were, or the most recent you were talking about, the uh, the traffic improvements. Um, I noted in the staff report, it talks about a turn lane if you're heading eastbound on um, Sardis Road, uh, a left turn lane heading eastbound on Sardis Road into Innovation Drive. And there's already one there, um, unless Innovation Drive is looked at as, you know, both ends, let's call it a, an easterly and a westerly, you know, uh, a loop, essentially. Um, it sounded like what you were talking about with the left turn out of Innovation Drive. Um, again, I wasn't sure which which one you were talking about. Are you talking about, you know, my understanding is that road is kind of a loop. It's an in one end, out the other end, Correct. It is, um, and um, our, our, I don't believe that. Well, David, if you can, uh, I may ask uh, David Hyder to speak to that uh, in a little bit more detail. But <clears throat> I believe that it was just a left turn out on Innovation Drive, not on Sardis. But I don't want to speak incorrectly. <clears throat> no, that's that's correct, Mike. Uh, that's, Hyder- yeah. So. Yeah, so I think the staff report uh, just uh, it included the um, the wrong street there for the left turn. Okay, that makes sense. Um, are there any things, and, and I don't want to have this become a discussion about traffic, but since we do have um, Mr. Hyder here from T, are there any salient points within, say, 45 seconds that you wish to discuss? And you can say no. <laughs> I would pr- I would prefer not to. Every th- um, we made some adjust. Most of the changes we made w- involve signal timings, uh, and so and those are re- easily done in the field on a on a very sim- on a very straightforward basis. So, okay, thank you. Um, uh, as far as the floodplain, I had I also had a question about that, and it relates to, you know, primarily the buildings I would say that are in phase two, but certainly there's one in phase one. There's also shown um, segmental retaining walls on the essentially what would be the Hominy Creek side. Um, they're listed out, and I'm sure that this is not the case. It's you know kind of the generic um, designed by others, twelve foot max height. But I'm just curious what do you see those walls being? Because obviously that's how you're raising your base flood elevation. So I'm just kind of curious, what do you see those behind buildings? Um, you know, it's kind of the one here, looking at the screen in the kind of upper, upper middle and then down towards that lower corner. Um, what, do you, what do you expect those retaining wall heights to be realistically to get to your base flood elevation for that flat pad? All right, give me just a moment to drive over to those plans. But essentially, what um, I described the floodway as being the critical flow path. And, uh, you know, FEMA um, 
discourages any work in, within the floodways. So we have retaining walls to hold up some slopes as we um, get into a couple pinch points. Um, but uh, we would have, uh, I'm thinking that they're in the 12 uh, foot range, plus or minus, well, let's see here. There I have a slope. And some of that too, we have, um, you know, we'll have some stairway access down our fill slopes to those. Um, our fill slope ranges from 14 to approximately 20 feet in height. Um, any retaining walls on the site would require uh, building permits and uh, the UDL, UDO also has screening requirements for those. And I guess, I guess some of the question is, is that a retaining wall or is it somewhat slope with a shorter retaining wall. I mean, you're talking about that there would be potentially a 20 foot retaining wall, you know, right along the edge of that walkway. They are kind of in that, that image you're showing right now, or is it mostly slope and then say a four foot retaining wall? Uh, that particular one we have, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to, we would rather not build retaining walls. So we are only including the retaining walls where we can't fit, physically fit that slope at a two to one slope or, you know, or at a stable method that we want, want to achieve. So we try to minimize them as much as we possibly can. Okay. It's a little hard to see at that scale. I'm trying to. Yeah, definitely. Um, kind of related to that, and I know it came up uh, with a couple of the other commissioners, you know, obviously there are requirements with working within the 100 and 500 year floodplain and, and you're doing some rework of the grades within those and, you know, certainly understandable FEMA is going to be involved. Um, what, what impacts are they or is anyone looking at downstream due to this uh, reconfiguration of grade that is actually taking place in the 100 year floodplain? Mm -hmm. So how um, FEMA sets their base flood elevations is they assume that all the flood plains have been filled above or, you know, essentially are all filled up. And then they determine what the uh, rise of the water elevation would be. And they call that the base flood elevation. So FEMA's models incorporate the fact that flood plains may be uh, filled and, and impacted. And that's why they so tightly regulate the floodway portion, that critical flow path. If we're going to do any work within the floodway, it would require a no rise study where we prove to FEMA that we will not have any impacts on the width of the flooding, um, no rises in the flood elevation. And also they do not allow us to have any decrease in that flood elevation. Okay. Thank, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I went over to that property today and walked down in there and just was kind of curious about all that. And, you know, I certainly, I, I definitely want to commend you. I think it's, it's nice the way you have laid this out, kept the juristic, you know, the, the stream that's running through, provided those buffers around there. I do think you've done a, a really good job to be able to provide that open space and, and maintain some of those tree canopies um, that are around. So uh, I, I, Definitely commend you all uh, uh, for that. Um, are there any other comments or questions from the, any of the other commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Barton. Thank you, Chair Archibald. Um, yeah, I, I would echo that sentiment. You know, I think that this is a, a challenging shaped parcel, and um, so I, I certainly commend the keeping streams daylit uh, being incorporated into the, you know, final development plan. Um, I, you know, the technical modification being requested is around sidewalk width and looking at the site plan, um, you know, just a quick scan, it seems extremely reasonable to keep two six foot sidewalks, you know, that serve one building. And then I think there's a 10 foot sidewalk out to Sardis Road and then the, um, what were being called greenways, but just walking paths along the Hominy Creek are labeled as 10 feet in the um, application packet. That, that all seems 
very reasonable. So on the technical um, modification being sought, I, I see no reason not to support this. I, I didn't hear an answer to the question around acceptance of Section 8 vouchers. And so I'd just like to take an opportunity to, um, you know, implore the applicant to consider this. Um, I know it's a voluntary um, commitment that the applicant is making to provide even any affordable units. And so that's very much appreciated. 80% AMI rents right now uh, for a one bedroom or in excess of $1,000, two bedroom in excess of 1,200 and a three bedroom in excess of 1,400. What the Section 8 voucher allows is it opens up that unit to a family that, um, you know, is at a much deeper affordability level. So um, I, I really hope that the applicant would consider it. Um, it comes with, you know, guaranteed rent. So if there is, say, a global pandemic and people are unable to pay rent, um, the Section 8 voucher uh, still has tremendous value. So, um, you know, as you move forward with the project, uh, please do consider for the affordable units, um, making a commitment to Section 8 because it'll really provide opportunities for um, the families most in need in our community. And, and I'll, I'll go ahead and jump on that, not to cut off uh, Commissioner Faircloth, but to answer uh, Commissioner Barton. Um, uh, one, thank you for really getting the affordable housing piece and, and recognizing um, that it's voluntary from the, the developer and it's a big commitment. And when I dropped off from the, the video, I actually was checking in with my client to make sure that they were okay with the vouchers. And I can report back to, to you, Commissioner Barton and, and this board that uh, they'll accept uh, vouchers on this project with their 10% uh, affordable housing commitment. Well, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Allen, and please convey that uh, uh, to your client as well. And, and, and you did all, before I uh, have Commissioner Fairclaw uh, chime in, um, I, I do appreciate you kind of clarifying what I mentioned, Mr. Allen, and I do very much appreciate that the developer is coming, uh, not asking uh, for the Luigi from the city, um, you know, certainly what you had mentioned, uh, the 80,000, and that's 80,000 per unit typically. Um, you know, that that is it's an investment that the city has to make. Um, but if the city doesn't have to make that, that's that's great as well. So definitely appreciate the the client, uh, your client willing to step up at the 10 percent all in on their on their own dime. So thank you, uh, Commissioner Faircloth. Hey, I want to say um, thank you to uh, Mr. Allen and Mr. Anderson, uh, Ace Engineering and the. Uh, the applicant uh, for their willingness for affordable housing. That means a lot to me. And I'm very excited about that. Um, what I'm about to say is not at all an attack on the developer. Uh, I'm just nervous about the regulation of the erosion during the project. And I realize, you know, the developer is being certainly willing to commit to the regulatory standards, um, city ordinances and such. I'm just one for public comment to, or not public comment, but a uh, public record to make sure that it's known that there is serious concerns about that. And, uh, and, uh, and that's not something Mr. Allen or Mr. Anderson can necessarily respond to. I'm just nervous about that. Um, but thank you. And I, I very much enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fairclough. Um, Thank you. Uh, Shannon, uh, if I may ask a question, you know, we, we haven't included anything about um, uh, the stream restoration and stream bank stabilization to date, even though it's been discussed uh, a, a little bit as we headed to this point. Do we need to include anything in the conditions about being able to disturb within the existing 30 foot stream buffer in order to do that activity? Or I, I figured it would happen at a staff level during the um technical design and review process but just since we're here it just i just thought of that might be an issue to consider you're muted Shannon. oh oops you're muted <laughs> it's probably best i'll double check with our stormwater staff but my understanding is you're allowed to disturb within the buffer when it's for the purpose of restoration or planting um so i i'll make sure we get that described appropriately in our um, conditions. But I would I was going to ask a, a similar question, which is we haven't highlighted that as a project condition. And I think it may be worth doing so uh, because it, it just further demonstrates support of the city's comprehensive plan. If you're restoring a jurisdictional body, 
you know, that's that's a positive and that's something we should probably highlight. If we if we do something like that, um, not, I don't know who's going to talk. Sorry to cut you off. Um, and, and I can work with 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 Janice and, and Shannon on this. Um, I get nervous when we start to put things in that are covered in other parts of the ordinance. If we do much more than say this is covered in other parts of the ordinance and we will comply with, with that. Um, because it starts to muddies up, muddy up the well, conditions. In a restoration system. isn't covered in the ordinance. It's not it required. Um, so if you, I don't, I don't know when, you know, so restoration can mean a lot of different things. So I think what we need probably is a little bit more information, Mike, from you and your team as to what that includes. And if this is something that goes above and beyond what's required, then I think that that's worth highlighting. Uh, we're, we're certainly happy to highlight it. There is a pretty intensive permit process as we go through that. So we had in, presented it as um a must have or it, it's it's a project goal but we don't know 100 percent what's all going to be involved with that um, i've been involved in a couple of other projects where we've done that with great success and we were able to do it well within budget we know that there's some issues with the the existing stream banks out there and we want to correct those but i, I just want to be careful about it being tied to um, a must with a project approval, even though we know it, something is going to have to be done, but I just want to be careful about how well, we commit to that. Can I recommend that maybe you, Derek, and I find 15 minutes to kind of brainstorm on it? Maybe there's a low bar we Great. can set. Well, and Absolutely. I was going to say, I, I certainly commend you guys for, for doing that, um, Mr. Allen, and Mr. Anderson, and I, I was going to suggest that we probably don't include it tonight in the conditions because the little bit that I do know um, about dealing with stream restorations and that you're correct, Mr. Anderson. I mean, there's a big process there and it can mean a lot of different things. So I would feel on, I, I would like it if you guys, if, if your team agrees to doing that, I would love to see that as a condition because then it holds you to that. But I also, on the other hand, right now, tonight, would feel uncomfortable putting that on you without having that really detailed, because I know that is just a huge, you know, there, there are many layers to that. So I, I appreciate that. And, and we will yeah. commit to, to work with Shannon to come up with something that affects our intent that we can reduce to writing and, and that, that Janice and city staff and, and city attorney's office will approve. So we'll work on that offline. OK, great, great. Um, yeah, and also, absolutely. Just to uh, clarify for the conditions um, that, let's see, which number is it? Shoot, I just had it here. It's on the first page. Number 10 of the project conditions where it's talking about the um, total number of units designated 80% uh, AMI, that there would be the line included that um, you would accept section eight housing vouchers. Would that be for all of them or a portion of them? Because we should have that at least in the, you know, amend these conditions tonight, correct? That that would be preferred, yes. And my, well, I, I thought I had understood that the housing vouchers would be accepted for the whole 10%. And, and that's what I just want to make sure that that is correct. Yeah, that is correct. Okay. All right. And, Great. And I just want to clarify because there are times like when we do have a Luigi where we say that a certain percentage of those units will go to Section 8 vouchers. Um, and I heard it was more generally if somebody comes along with a Section 8 for these units, then that they, they would accept that, you know, everything else being, you know, as part of the process. But not that they have to, that those units are set aside for Section 8. I, did I get that right? That it's that any of those affordable units, you would accept Section 8 vouchers. That's correct. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. Um, before I forget this time, let's uh, open for public comment at 6.08. Do we have anybody waiting on the line for public comment? Chair, there are no callers in the speaker queue. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Two. We will close for public comment. I'll call it 609.
Is there any further discussion among the commissioners or any further questions that you have for the applicant or staff? And if not, um, I'll accept a motion, knowing that the motion, so we have revised that B1 condition, um, we probably should put that into the motion in some way. Probably could just be at the end of the, the motion that's on the staff report, just stating that uh, the affordability um, component of the of the I was about to say B1 conditions exhibit E project conditions uh, will include housing uh, section eight housing vouchers. I'll try. <laughs> I move to approve the conditional zoning request for the property located at 235 Sardis Road from commercial industrial CI to residential expansion conditional zone RES EXP CZ with an amendment to the future land use map of the Living Asheville comprehensive plan from industrial manufacturing to residential neighborhood and find that the request is reasonable, is in the public interest is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan and meets the development needs of the community and that the request one, encourages responsible growth by increasing the city's housing supply in areas close to jobs and schools. Two, increases the diversity of housing in the area, including affordable housing. And three, promotes access to open space, preserves open space and natural waterways. And we have the um, revision to the conditions for this. Um, a statement that the affordable housing uh, condition will include um, the option for applicants to uh, submit Section 8 vouchers. On the, the, accept for the acceptance yes. of housing choice vouchers for the those affordable units. Of housing choice vouchers. Perfect. Perfect. So there's a motion. Do I have a second? Second. That was Mr. Hoke, correct? Yes. All right. I will do a roll call vote again. Um, Commissioner Faircloth. Aye. Commissioner Bubenik. Aye. Commissioner Simmons. Aye. Commissioner Barton. Aye. Commissioner Hoke. Aye. Commissioner Leva or Vice Chair Levi. Aye. And I will vote aye as well. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Allen, Mr. Anderson, uh, applicant. Appreciate all your work on that project. Uh, yeah, thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Um, before we move on to the next agenda item, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to need to take a break again. As I mentioned, I haven't been feeling great, so I've been popping a little too much cold medicine. So uh, can we do a five minute break? Uh, come back at 617. Yep. Sure.
Okay, I think we have everyone back. So at 618, we will get started again. So the next item on our agenda is a request to conditionally rezone a portion of the property located at 990 Tunnel Road from residential multifamily low density RM6 to Office 2 Conditional Zone 02-CZ. The property is identified as PIN 9668-07-8758 in the Buncombe County Tax Record. The property owner is James Mills and John Laney Jr. And the project contact is Warren Sugg. Planner coordinating review is Shannon Tuck. Ms. Tuck. I think you're muted. I was, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think we can probably move through this conditional zoning request um, pretty quickly. So I will go ahead and get started. As Mr. Archibald has indicated, this is another conditional zoning, uh, oops, there we go. Another conditional uh, zoning petition for the property located at 990 Tunnel Road. As you can see from the Exhibit A and A1 maps, the uh, subject property is located right on Tunnel Road, very close to the intersection with Maple Springs Road. The property also has frontage on Campground Road, um, located here at the rear. It kind of looks like it should be a corner lot, but it's not quite. There is this little tiny piece of a uh, of property that actually belongs to the Buncombe County School Board across the street. This is the uh, Bell Elementary School for those who are familiar with East Asheville. Um, so it's not quite on the corner, but it's very close to the corner. The property today is zoned RM6. And the entire parcel is approximately, it's a little less than one and a half acres. And it actually includes this piece here to the east. So just like the former application, we are rezoning a portion of the PIN number that Mr. Archibald read, read off. About two thirds of the property is proposed to be rezoned from the existing designation of RM6, uh, which is a residential multifamily designation to Office 2 conditional zone as shown in the Exhibit A1 map. The purpose of this rezoning is to allow for the construction of a small, sort of small to mid-size uh, medical office, more specifically a dental office. Uh, again, just like the former application, the future land use map identifies this property as residential neighborhood. And so a change in the future land use map would be necessary to support a non-residential use. The most appropriate designation we feel is traditional corridor, which you see this little kind of corner down here. If you're familiar with the Sonic on Tunnel Road, um, that is one of those traditional corridor properties on the, the southern side of Tunnel Road. And you can see it's it's almost contiguous to the subject property, but not quite. And so we think that that's probably the most appropriate designation. Looking at the Exhibit B aerial imagery, you can see that the property is largely undeveloped. It is vacant. Um, there has been some minor um, improvements. I think there's been some fill added and some um, you know gravel to the site to kind of help create a building pad at some point. Um, right now, if you were to drive by the property, you would it, you almost don't see any of this because the kudzu is, is pretty rampant in this area, so it kind of gets eclipsed, um, or this property gets eclipsed by that. Um, oh, I should also point out there is a very small little jurisdictional stream that kind of hugs this eastern boundary as well. The site plan is very straightforward. Um, the proposal is to add a single two-story medical office building, a dentist's office, as I mentioned earlier. It would be a maximum of two stories, a maximum of 14,000 square feet. Um, this particular plan shows, this is a conceptual plan, and it shows 40, 40 parking spaces. Um, but the conditions that were included with this project just describe that whatever the square footage of this building ends up being, that it will meet the city's UDO requirements for off-street parking. 
There is a single vehicular entrance on Tunnel Road, so there will be uh, full access from Tunnel Road. There, there will no, not be any additional access onto Campground Road, which is a residential road. Um, the applicant is asking to retain the existing five-foot backup curb sidewalk. That is a non-compliant sidewalk to Asheville standards but it's a relatively new sidewalk. And so we support uh, keeping the existing sidewalk rather than replace it or rip it out and replace it with a new wider sidewalk. The, um, there would also be sidewalk requirement on Campground Road. We all agree, the applicant and staff agree that the more important sidewalk connection would be here on Maple Springs to potentially help connect people to the school and or to um, transit stops along Tunnel Road. The applicant is willing to reach out to Buncombe County, and if they are amenable, they will agree to build that sidewalk piece on Maple Springs as opposed to Campground Road. There is some difficulty with Campground Road um, for sidewalk. The, um, the applicant or this particular proposal is required to provide a buffer. Um, that becomes more difficult with the sidewalk. And also we have the stream and the applicant would be able to build sidewalk up to a certain point and then would have to stop short of the culvert um, because there isn't enough width of the, on the culvert to actually bridge it with a sidewalk. So um, if the applicant is unable to work with Buncombe County to be able to get this sidewalk connection on Maple Springs, they have agreed that they would pay a fee in lieu. So there was the question earlier today from uh, Commissioner Bubenik about these, you know, sidewalks that don't connect. Um, that sidewalk fee in lieu for a sidewalk that wouldn't connect to anything on Campground Road is something that could potentially be used by the city to make this more important sidewalk connection in the future if the applicant is unable to do it. So that's just a handy example of, of how that works. The other thing is um, the portion of the property that is not included in the rezoning, this what is described as lot two on the site, um, it's a little under a half acre is proposed to be retained in the RM6 zoning designation. So that would allow for some additional residential infill development in the future. So this rezoning this property doesn't take all of it out of consideration for future residential infill. And also it would help potentially buffer this non-residential use from its residential neighbors. Um, it was described a little bit in the compatibility section of the staff report, but this property is a little bit unique in that it is, it is almost level with Tunnel Road, but it actually sits in kind of a little depression. From this low spot, you go up in elevation in all directions. So the properties across the street sit higher, the properties across Tunnel Road sit higher, Bell Elementary sits up high up on a hill. Um, it's relatively level. It, I think it drops a little bit as you go to the to the west, um, and then um, but then again, this parcel kind of helps buffer this property. So uh, this just sort of further supports uh, rezoning, taking this property out of residential zoning and putting it in the commercial designation. We do not have building elevations. This, this pro project is very conceptual at this stage. The applicant is not prepared or hasn't um, gotten that far in the process. They know approximately what their space needs are, but they haven't uh, hired an architect to kind of design the building yet. So we don't have those building elevations. They have, however, agreed to some conditions that would help keep that building somewhat compatible with the residences in the area. Um, we're still working on these conditions, but this is kind of a sample of, of what we're proposing um, to kind of help ensure that the project is you know, kind of, not, not that it should look like a residence, but that it's compatible with the residential structures in the neighborhood. Other conditions associated with the project, again, it's a maximum of two stories, a maximum of 14,000 square feet. The off-site sidewalk on Maple Springs Road is identified and called out in the conditions. Um, we will get a sidewalk easement along Campground Road, um, regardless of whether or not a sidewalk is constructed or a fee in lieu is paid, that is a condition as well. Um, the building design standards that I just discussed, there are a few technical modifications mostly related to the sidewalks. Um, a little bit about the buffer. 
Um, let me just go back to the site plan briefly. So normally property line buffers go directly against the property line, but we have this jurisdictional stream here. So the applicant has asked to put the buffer on this side of the stream. So it's not right on the property line, but it's kind of on the stream bank and on the um, just above it. Uh, we, we thought that that was um, maybe even preferred because it helps filter water moving into the stream. So thought that was a good option. And uh, other than that, it's just our standard two-year approval process um, during which the applicant must obtain their zoning permit and apply for their building permits. So in conclusion, staff does, a recommend, does recommend approval of the proposed conditional zoning. I'd be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ms. Tuck. Um, can you, I just wanna make sure we clarify the fee in lieu part because I thought I had understood it. And then when you were just describing it, maybe I didn't understand it right. Sure. So they want to, and and I fully support having the sidewalk on Maple Spring. I think that makes all the sense in the world, but obviously understanding. <laughs> and one, I'm sure the applicants already tried to reach out and buy that little part of parcel of what is a stream <laughs> from Buncombe County. Um, but if they can't put the sidewalk along Maple Springs Road, they would do the sidewalk on campground with a fee in lieu for the portion that they can't do because of the stream. Is that correct? Not quite. So okay. that's how it would normally work. <laughs> but in this case, uh, we just, we again, because they couldn't build the sidewalk across the stream part, um, if we made them comply, they would have sidewalk here that not only did it not connect to tunnel, it doesn't even go all the way out to Maple Spring. So even if the school one day put a sidewalk here, it wouldn't connect to campground because of that missing piece across the culvert. So uh, technical compliance is building the sidewalk. This particular project wouldn't technically be eligible for fee and lieu. They could apply for a variance and would probably get the variance. Um, but in this particular case, because it's a conditional zoning, we agree and support paying a fee for the entire length of the sidewalk should they not be able to do the sidewalk on Maple Springs. So the proposal to do the Maple Springs sidewalk is in lieu of the campground road sidewalk. So if that is successful, then that's what would be required. If they're unable to do Maple Springs, they would pay a fee for the entire length of the sidewalk on campground, but give us an easement for future sidewalk connection in the future. Okay, and that's, it, I think maybe the conditions, or at least the way I'm reading the conditions, don't say that because it says six foot back of, so yeah, it talks about the sidewalk on Tunnel Road maintaining six foot back of curb sidewalk constructed along campground. The event the applicant could gain approval, they would install it on Ma Maple Springs. But then should the campground road sidewalk be constructed, a small fee in lieu of sidewalk would be paid for the portion that crosses oh, the jurisdiction. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that, that has been revised since. Um, I was We were working that out with the applicant um, in the, the the day right before these got posted. So Okay. I just, yeah, I just I apologize. Wanted, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure because what you're saying makes complete sense. Like yeah. there's, yeah. again, this is one of those rare instances where I'm going to go, yeah, it makes no sense to put a sidewalk on campground as much as I love putting sidewalks that go nowhere. Um, it just, yeah, that, I, I drove out there and I'm like, why this? Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, that's exactly true. So the originally, you know, we were saying, well, if you can't do Maple Springs, you have to do it on, on campground. That's what would be technically required. But in discussing it further with the applicant, we realized that it makes more sense to pay in fee and lieu for the whole thing. Um, we had actually, I had actually changed that in the um, the original document, but I failed. It sounds like I failed to upload a, a that replace the the PDF in your meeting material. So I apologize. That, that that's fine. Question, and and I see there's a couple hand raised. One real quick because it relates to sidewalks. Was there any discussion with the applicant about improving the bus stop there? That's right, kind of right. Well, I'm pointing on my screen, but it's basically right, right about the end of the building, kind of the sidewalk almost bumps out there. Was there any discussion about like right now there's a pad? Was there a discussion about 
you know, providing a bus shelter, paying for the bus shelter, et cetera. We, we did not discuss that. It didn't come up in TRC, but um, we can certainly ask the applicant this evening. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, Commissioner Bubenek, you had your hand raised. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to talk about sidewalks and the bus stop as well. So um, as far as the tunnel road sidewalk, I know, Shannon, that you said it is newer, but it is like a non-compliant sidewalk. And um, so I wanted to see, like, my recommendation is that we get them to um, put more money into that sidewalk fund that we've talked about this evening, because since they are kind of getting out of not having to put a new sidewalk in on Tunnel Road, um, and they're not having to, um, like, update this sidewalk since it's, like, newer, but it's not compliant, and it literally has the telephone poles like right in the middle of the sidewalk um so i would like recommend to the committee that we have them put money into that fund so that um we're not continuing to build these i know that we're not like really building these anymore but also that we are upgrading and continuing to like do better sidewalks because they're literally like getting out of putting sidewalks in for their building and then along with what um, commissioner archwald said was um, as also with the um, bus stop, um, because I could see a lot of people like taking the bus down to this dental office. And this kind of goes along with like the last plan that I didn't get to say, but it's like all these like parking spots, like 40 parking spots at like this small dental office. There was like 250 spots at like the last place. Like we're just continuing to say like, drive your car, drive your car. But there's literally a bus stop right outside of this. So like, let's make a nice bus stop where we're encouraging people to like take the bus to the dentist office. Um, and they have the opportunity right now as they're building this brand new spot to do those things. We, um, you know, our fee in lieu option, this, again, this project doesn't technically, it's not technically eligible for the fee in lieu. Like if this wasn't a conditional zoning, this wouldn't be something that could be considered. But um, our fee in lieu does allow for an applicant to pay a portion of the sidewalk. So if it's a non-compliant sidewalk, so in this case, it's a five foot back of curb, we would at least require a six foot back of curb. We, it does allow them to break down and pay the, for the portion that is in compliance. So what's missing that one extra foot, we could have them pay a prorated amount for that one foot. That would be an easy uh, way to um, have an objective, uh, standard, if, if that's something that the applicant was willing to do and add as their conditions. That Thank you for bringing that up, Commissioner Rubenick, because I had not made the leap, you know, this whole, we've gone back and forth on that whole fee and lieu thing, I think, Ms. Tuck, and I, I hadn't really made the leap to, hmm, if we've got a perfectly fine condition-wise sidewalk that doesn't quite meet the WIT standard, could we get them to pay a fee in lieu? To, again, it's kind of like what I brought up at, um, last month with the project that was downtown and the perfectly good five feet of sidewalk. Um, so that's that's a great idea. Obviously, we have to ask if the applicant would be, would be amenable to that. Miss Ashley, you had your hand raised or? It was just a clarification. So, so Shannon, you had said, if we do the fee in lieu, that they would, I thought you said, that they would be dedicating an easement to the city. But in this case, they're doing the fee in lieu because they really don't have a place to put the sidewalk. So they, actually what Ms. Ms. Bubenick is saying seems to make sense. You're saying fee in lieu or part of it might be fee in lieu fee, actually money that could be used for a sidewalk in this vicinity and part of it, oh, they would pave the additional foot if that's an agreed upon condition. Yeah, there are two sidewalks that we're discussing. Um, the one that Ms. Bubenek brought up is the, the the existing sidewalk on Tunnel Road. It's only five feet. Normally, we would require at least six feet if it's a back of curb. So it's short one foot. If this was a, a buy right application, they wouldn't even have an option for a fee. They'd have to just rip out that sidewalk and put in a, at least a six foot back of curb. In this case, um, Ms. Bubenek's recommendation is that they pay a fee for what is deficient. Um, and our fee in lieu standard accommodates that. So it's just a, an objective way to um, basically kind of gain compliance, I suppose. 
The other sidewalk that it would normally be required is the campground road sidewalk. So on this side, we're saying that the applicant is committing to providing us an easement for future sidewalk. And instead of building sidewalk here on campground road, they would give us the easement and pursue constructing a sidewalk on Maple Springs. Because this is not, they don't have control over this little piece of property. This belongs to Buncombe County School Board. Um, we wrote the conditions such that if they're unable to gain approval to do the sidewalk on Maple Springs, that they would pay a fee in lieu for the sidewalk on campground. Fee in lieu and dedicate that area, and even though we're saying that's not really a good area for a sidewalk. I thought well, that's it's beautiful. not that it's a bad area. It's just that um, the applicants, part of the applicants' buffers in this area behind the building. So it could be. It could be a sidewalk in the future. It would just likely require removing some vegetation. Um, and the the project conditions actually contemplate that. Okay. I just wanted to clarify, because just so everyone knows, typically the fee in lieu means you can't do it on your property. So you're putting in so that it can be done. A, a sidewalk can be put somewhere in the near area for that use in that area. But um, so in this case, it sounds like we would want that dedicated to us. Okay. Yeah. I think we the want the easement. Read like that. Yeah. It's probably more accurate to say it's not that it couldn't go here. It's that we think it's a higher priority to put it somewhere else or to get the fee for other connections. Yeah. That's what I was saying is like, you know, if, if it's not going to go here, I think it should go somewhere else. You know, since, since what it was originally said was, this is a perfectly good sidewalk. So we're not asking them to like put in a new sidewalk, but I think we should ask them to put in lieu of so that we can put it somewhere else where the, a perfectly good sidewalk does need to go. Basically. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I think the idea of the part along the campground road is it's not like it couldn't be done. It's that that's their buffer. And the buffer for the residents that are there now, the buffer is, I'm sure, way more important than the sidewalk. 15 years from now, the sidewalk may be important. And then at least there's the easement to be able to do the sidewalk. So I think, I think it's a good way around it. I will not attempt to uh, revise that condition. Maybe we can just say that that condition will be revised before it goes to council, I guess. Um, the one... Speaking of the conditions, so the one other thing, and, and we'll ask the applicant about the fee and lieu for the one foot on Tunnel Road, and then about the bus stop. The one other condition that that just, I don't, it doesn't give me heartache, but the in number three, where it talks about facades greater than 35 feet in width shall be articulated by varying the setback materials and or window door openings. To me, it's a little vague. It's like you could do one of those three I think it should be that it has to vary, like the front elevation needs to have some articulation and then the other two certainly, but you know, like the, um, you know, there is the requirement for buildings, you know, if there's more than, is it 50 feet linear, it has to then push in or out. Oh God, I, I'm sure you remember those numbers right off the top of your head, Shannon, but I'm thinking about that because that wall on Tunnel Road is gonna be more than 35 feet, so. Yeah, it's, um, I think because we also require a, um, a primary entrance or a principal entrance, like a well-marked primary entrance on the front facade, the applicant wasn't really concerned about being able to break up the facade. So it's, it's probably overkill in this particular case, but, um, but yes, you're thinking of some of our form code standards that say when your facade is over a certain amount, you must offer some relief. I think that's an easy enough condition to adjust. If the applicant is open to that, it sounded like they weren't too worried about it initially. So, okay, yeah, again, it's kind of one of those. It's just you know, I figured that will happen, but as much as I'd like to make sure it does, uh, Commissioner Barton, you had a comment or a question. Yes, thank you, Chair Archibald. Um, just a quick clarification question on that same uh, number three in the project conditions. Um, the third bullet point says a prominent front entrance facing the road. By that we mean tunnel road, right? There's... Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, tunnel road. 
I, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, you know, I this may be getting ahead of ourselves and I'd love to hear what the applicant has to say about um, these conditions that are fairly general and seem, you know, reasonable and easily achievable. The site plan that we have here um, looks like the parking area along Tunnel Road is there because there's a, an existing storm pipe. Um, and so there's they're not placing the building up closer to Tunnel Road. And so because of that, it seems like the main visitor entrance or client entrance will be um, to the left uh, from the parking area. And then there, it might be that there's like an employee entrance facing Tunnel Road. So I just, I don't know, I, I, to me, it maybe seems less important that we have a prominent you know, condition that there be a prominent front entrance facing Tunnel Road, just acknowledging the realities of this site and the constraints. Um, but we can, I, I'd love to hear from the applicant and, and see what their thoughts on the matter. And one thing we discussed with the applicant, uh, that did come up. Um, you, we see that there's, you know, the accessible parking is on that um, Western side. And, you know, we, we see some projects kind of do like a corner entrance and we thought that that could be acceptable based on, you know, as long as the design kind of makes it clear and readable. Um, but we are trying to kind of give this building some, some orientation. And I think that that well-defined entrance is, is important. It doesn't need to be the main customer entrance. It can be, you know, secondary in use, but just be a well-defined entrance. Um, so that's kind of what we were, were shooting for. Yeah, you know, I think in most cases, we probably would look at that site plan and go, we would want the building to be up against the front and not have the parking in the front, but you're right with the storm, the existing, um, I think it's labeled as an existing stream culvert. I'm sure Mr. Sugg can advise us further, but yeah, it, whether talking about the entrances, yeah. Um, any further questions for staff at the moment? All right, let's let the applicant make their presentation. Mr. Sugg, I presume that you will be speaking for the applicant. Thank you, Commissioner Archibald and members of the commission. Warren Sugg with Civil Design Concepts. I also have uh, Dr. Callan and Dr. Allison White of Asheville Dentistry uh, that are that are here with us tonight. And they are the they're the client and they're also the, the prospective uh, developer and owner and operator of of this facility. Um, I'd like to, to thank staff. Uh, Shannon and I have been talking about this particular site for uh, more than six months now um, to give a little wrap around. Uh, at one point we were considering this as a straight rezone and for any number of different reasons, um, just the, 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 the complexities of a straight rezone and the, the optionalities of all the different things that could be installed here was something that staff um, wasn't comfortable with. And that's why we're, you know, here before you with a with a CZ. Um, a CZ for this size of project is at least uncommon for uh, me in my career. Usually these CZs are much larger. They're, you know, apartment complexes like what we just saw or, um, you know, hotels and, and a lot of other large projects. So this is very, um, small and i don't say that in, in diminishing my clients you know desires but just in realities of of what a cz typically is um that said um you know we're super excited about the project i'll, I'll let you know callan and allison you know uh, add to it um, if there's an appropriate time for them to speak about it but they are local uh, folks they've got a couple different um, practices around town they're they're currently looking to get out of a uh, rental space and have something of their own that they develop and operate and, and own so there's uh there's there's a lot of excitement about having that here we think this is a great spot um uh one one thing i'd like to really uh, mention and you you asked a little question about it is the uh the storm there there is a storm pipe that goes through there it's been there for a number of decades uh, the site has set for a number of decades, pretty much unused and vacant. It's, it has been encumbered with quite a bit of um, kudzu and current landowners 
as well as um, neighbors when we had a neighborhood meeting all, you know, just sort of mentioned that and they were excited about the opportunity for something to be developed here that would, um, you know, be it, be it used and cut down on the, uh, the kudzu that just takes over. A um, couple things to mention and, and Shannon did a great job of kind of um, giving a great overview of the project. I'm happy to answer um, those specific questions on, on things, but um, we are, you know, ultimately wishing to do a, a dedicated um, dental office here, uh, recognizing that's what the CZ allows us to do is to be uh, specific with that. Um, utilities are available. We have sewer that's uh, along Tunnel Road that we can have easy access to. Water is along Campground Road uh, and we can uh, make our access to uh, domestic uh, water for that. Uh, we have spaces available, uh, parking that is off of the access from Tunnel. Um, as Shannon mentioned, um, that final number will certainly be within the, the mins and maxes that the city of Asheville allows once we determine that exact square footage and exact building. Um, because that storm pipe is up front, um, that is why the building is pushed where it is and we, we'd like to keep it um, situated so that we don't have it on top of a, on a storm uh, pipe. Um, couple other things we have already reached out to Tim Fearley at Buncombe County Schools and began that conversation about getting a sidewalk uh, allowance along Maple Springs um, he said we were too late to be on the December uh, school board meeting but um, there's been talk of us being on the January school board meeting agenda so that would be our intent I've made him aware of our desires um, there's a fairly small portion of this that would actually be on uh, their property, you know, just a small little triangle area at the intersection. And the rest of it should be uh, within right away. So uh, hopefully it's a win-win for them as well. It's a piece of property that Buncombe County Schools has no use for and would certainly hope that it would encourage um, people to be able to walk to and from school. And, and hopefully maybe later on there's additional sidewalk that goes up Maple Springs, um, either by the school or by any number of other um, entities. Um, we uh, we certainly hear your comments about um, the fee and lieu. Uh, our, our desire is to do that Maple Springs sidewalk. Uh, if that hits a dead end, we'll certainly do the fee and lieu and, and do the, um, the easement requirements for, for the future. Um, I think I'll just stop right there and, and answer any questions you all have of me. I, I, I do, I guess I will touch on uh, Mr. Barton's comments about the predominant front and side. Yeah, we, we don't know the exact program of the building yet where that entrance will be, but in my discussions with um, Shannon, we certainly recognize we're not gonna have just a, a rectangular flat building. It's gonna have windows and doors and awnings and things that will sort of uh, move in and out. So we don't have any real concerns over the fenestration and, and breaking up of the mass of the building. Um, but we don't know at this very moment exactly where the door, um, door or doors will be. And, and likely there will be multiple doors, one for uh, visitors and guests and those for, for the uh, for the staff, so we 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 would love a little more flexibility on that. And then one other thing that's that's in the comments um, that I know is still being worked through is uh, tinting of windows. And we would request that we can uh, tint the windows as a privacy uh, item. And I've and I've, I've made um, made the client and staff sort of aware of that conversation. And it's something that'll be ongoing. We certainly don't want to mirror tint them and have something that's just detracting or or a nuisance as they drive by, but um, privacy is a, is a big thing in um, any kind of medical field. Any questions of me? I just wanted to, to mention that the applicant had supplied some samples of sort of what they were thinking, you know, might kind of work in the site, but they are just, they're just ideas. So I didn't want to include them in the packets, but just for the sake of this discussion, you know, and talking about that primary front entrance or a little bit of articulation um, and the fenestration requirements. I think this kind of helps to give folks an idea of what's being considered. 
And, and we're comfortable working with the applicant further on refining those conditions about the character of the structure, um, including the tinting. We, we understand um, the need for privacy and we'll, you know, we'll, we just need a little bit more information about the degree of tinting and things of that nature. And maybe there's windows on the front can be untinted in the waiting area. And then it's really just tinting the, the windows and the, um, um, exam rooms. I would make the comment too about tinting. A lot of times you can achieve that with graphics or, you know, there's ways to do uh, privacy, you know, without um, necessarily having it fully tinted. So um, graphics or blinds. Is yeah. Another really common. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess Mr. Sugg and, and I did hear you say that the, um, your clients are, are on this call as well. Um, what would they or what are what are their thoughts on providing um, either providing a bus shelter? Uh, I believe the pad is, that is there is probably big enough. I'm not positive um, at that location as as one of the conditions. Sure, Archibald, it's, um, it's certainly not something that's been discussed up to this point uh, at a staff level or, or with my client. Um, here again, I'll kind of go back to um, what a traditional CZ, you know, and there, there, there are bigger ask things like shelters that that tend to come along with it. Um, and, you know, I'm going to make it sort of simple. This is a husband and wife situation. They're a small business. They're trying to do the right thing and go the right processes. Um, I would hope that we could keep the the additional conditions minimized. I don't I don't know exactly the cost of of one of those shelters, but it it certainly adds to the uh, the things that that are that are being put on the project. And it is a, a fairly small project in the in the scheme of things. Sure. It, and I completely understand that. Um, you know, again, I guess I'm just throwing it out there. I'm certainly not um, uh, hinging anything uh, on that at all. So. I do think it's a really good idea to explore with your client um, the, you know, maybe when they do have an architect, I, my, from what I've heard from others and other designers is it's less expensive to actually probably have somebody design a bus shelter, a simple bus shelter that reflects the character and the architecture of your new building than it would be to purchase and install the city's standard and you'd probably be more happy with, um, you know, your own version of that. Um, but it, given that this is a community service and there is an existing bus stop right on the road frontage, I do think it is a good uh, thing to explore and would certainly further, uh, su you know, demonstrate compliance with the city's comprehensive plan. And I think in the scheme of construction of this type, the additional cost is not excessive. Um, there's always costs associated with condition or with any kind of development. And just, just to clarify too, I, I understand where Warren's coming from when he describes large scale projects like the one we saw before being conditional zonings, but we have lots of small projects too that are conditional zonings. You saw the Franklin School of Innovation earlier, that was a conditional zoning. Just down the street is an office building that was a conditional zoning that's a, an even smaller parcel. It was more common to have small scale conditional zonings before we had the expansion districts that are really meant for large projects. So it's it's not uncommon to do a smaller scale conditional zoning. Commissioner Barton, you have a question or a comment? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Archibald. On the issue of the, um, the bus shelter, you know, I'm certainly a proponent of adding bus shelters to our, you know, growing bus network. It's an important piece of um, the, the puzzle, you know, to, to encourage ridership. At this location though, I don't, I mean, I don't see how it's um, going to be a huge benefit to the community. The extension of the sidewalk where the bus stop is only looks to be about an additional three feet, if that. So we're, we're talking about, you know, you can't block the sidewalk with the shelter, you know, the applicant would be adding probably an additional three feet of concrete minimum beyond that. 
in order to get the required, you know, ADA um, bus alighting area. Um, and then, you know, there, there are going to be further accessibility requirements probably connecting that bus shelter uh, potentially to the building. Um, so I, I think this is, it's sort of like we're, we're maybe aspirational for the right reasons, but it, we may be imposing a condition that has a lot of unintended consequences and would probably require a retaining wall on the back end. So I'd hesitate to put it in a, as a condition. I would certainly support having the applicant explore it with um, Mr. Sugg and the civil engineering team because we do need them, but, but it just doesn't seem in this location like it's that feasible. Yeah. I, they definitely would need to increase the size of the pad as far as any other access the sidewalk is going to provide, you know, provide the access sidewalk and then through the, um, I mean, they may have to do a slight piece of sidewalk next to the driveway probably would make the most sense so that it's not, you know, someone's not walking in the drive aisle, so to speak, um, to get in there. But um, certainly yeah. hear what you're saying. Um, I just, you know, I think it's one of those that we're always trying to get those. It's kind of like sidewalks. We always want, you know, if we can get a sidewalk put in, great. And so if we can get a bus shelter, I, I think it's great as well. And they are mobilizing concrete. Yeah. For the site, yeah. so. Uh, Commissioner Bubenik. Thank you. Um, I think we have to start holding holding everyone accountable that's coming before our commission, whether you're a small business, whether you're a large business, because, um, you know, like for the bus shelter, you know, that's something that we need. And if your business happens to be where the bus shelter is, that's something that you're going to have to hold yourself accountable and to put into your business plan. And, um, you know, so maybe you're not having to pay for the sidewalk, but you're having to pay for the bus shelter. And that's something that is your business. And it just happens to be right there um, in front of, you know, on the sidewalk. And as a, the commissioners, we have to think, um, yeah, it may not do something good right now because there's not a lot of traffic. But in 15 years, tunnel, that part of Tunnel Road is going to look completely different, just like how Henderson Mill Road looks different now, or how downtown looks different now. And if the commissioners 15 years ago had thought about the sidewalks in downtown, we might not be having this discussion about sidewalks right now. So that's why we're all on this board is to really have that like vision for the future and to really like walk our um, you know businesses through this process and kind of help them all figure that out. So while it may take like a retaining wall or it may take like an extra slab of concrete, we really have to think about like those kids that may be coming to the dentist after school with their parents or um, somebody who's living in those apartments down there by the VA, just taking the bus down to the dentist. So, um, you know, that's why this bus stop is important. That's why the extra foot on the sidewalk is important because the sidewalks are already not ADA accessible. Um, but maybe the bus stop is, and then they can go on into the dentist office. This is actually one of our higher ridership routes, the tunnel road. I've um, not, I know the, the South tunnel road section is, is, is a, the highest or one of the high, you know, second or first or second in terms of ridership. I'm not sure how far down tunnel road, but I know the overall route between the VA and downtown along tunnel road is one of our highest, um, has the highest ridership numbers. Yeah, certainly. Um, I just thank you, Commissioner Bubenik, for for making that statement. I, I certainly would agree uh, with with pretty much everything you said. I mean, it's definitely definitely that forward thinking of what what will it look like, not what does it look like now or what does it look like in the past, but what will it look like? So. Um, Joe, I just wanted to comment, yes. Shannon, and this is a question for you, but when when there's a condition for a bus stop, doesn't it usually come from our transportation department to say there's a need there? I, I, I heard somebody say there's already one right down the street. Sometimes when you build one that's a different design from, from the city's design, then the person has to maintain it. I mean, we had that in Monfort. It was a different design. So the city would not maintain it. So I thought our typical process was city request a dedication of an area perhaps requires it to be built to a city standard, but 
we've already checked with the transportation department that that is a needed stop. It, it, so well, it's an existing stop. I mean, it's um, it's not. We're not adding a bus stop. The stop's already there. The question is whether or not we should add a shelter. Um, and a shelter to the stop. Okay, that's mm -hmm. what I wasn't sure because I thought there was just yeah. already some shelter. And we're talking about in, either improving the shelter and improving the area. No. And at least I think the policy has changed. We had a, a different development application recently where now this one was downtown, but they were proposing a, a custom design shelter and the city was willing to maintain it. Um, they would install it, build it and install it, but then the city would maintain it. Okay. Commissioner yeah, Fairclough. I'm sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Uh, so uh, this question is directed more toward, I guess, the staff. I mean, is it typical to, the plans are well thought out that are submitted, but is it typical to have such a preliminary plan that we're giving two years commission, you know, conditional zoning to? I'm just it's it's a little unusual to have it this conceptual um but you know we are trying to be flexible and kind of recognize that it's you know the applicant is you know they're private business owners local business owners they're not um and, and professionals you know they're not developers and so they're unsure of what their plans are just yet and they're trying to secure the property and the opportunity to be able to do a dentist office at this location so if if they don't they they're reluctant to invest and actually large developers are this way too they're reluctant to invest too much in terms of design work until they know that they can actually that they'll be approved to construct a non-residential use here and i would like to comment um we actually don't own this property yet. So our purchase of this property is conditional on having it useful for our business. So we are trying to limit our investment into a potential area that we may not even be able to purchase. So we're really putting in quite a bit of investment up front to a theoretical plan. Um, so I think that is also a factor. It, if I appreciate that, if you can just state your name just for the record as yes, we're doing this, Allison White. <laughs> thank, thank you, Miss White. I, and I certainly understand, you know, where you're coming from. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of small business owners like like yourselves um, that would like to, you know, have a have a piece of property like this and and have your own building. And so there are there are a lot of hurdles um, to being able to do that for sure. Um, and, and I think. I think Commissioner Bubenik made made some good points, though, as far as a local small business pro providing something for the community looks even better. So, it, you know, again, it's that it's always a balance. So, sure. um, um, as I'm sure you, as I'm sure you're well aware of. So, um, <laughs> right. And as far uh, as the design of the building, you know, we are um, a, a family dentistry business. We have a our our patients are appreciative of our kind of um, homey feeling. Um, and so I believe, you know, our goal is for the building to look more residential, um, not, not a big square office building or something imposing. It's, it's going to be more welcoming. Um, and so even though we don't have those particular plans and it is more conceptual, as you mentioned, um, I would like to at least hopefully put your minds at ease <laughs> that that is our intent. Well, well, thank, thank you. Appreciate it very much. Um, let's go ahead and open for public comment at 706. If there is anybody on the line for public comment. Sure. There are no callers. All right. Let's call it closed at 706. Uh, is there any further discussion from the commissioners or questions for staff or for Mr. Sugg or the, the applicants? Yes, Vice Chair Levi. I, I would say I appreciate the plans for this. Uh, it definitely is an initial investment. I too would also like the kudzu to go away. So um, <laughs> it's been sitting there vacant for a while and this seems like a good use of the property. Um, and so I hope 
and moves forward. All right, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly um, thank you for, for bringing something that does uh, provide a, a certainly a good use, a neighborhood use, um, develops this, this piece of long vacant property. Um, I, I certainly would encourage you to consider the bus stop. I really, um, I, I'm kind of at odds a lot of times. If you were, if you were the last project, I would have been like, nope, there's going to be a bus stop or nothing else. Um, I, I, I try to, you know, understand that that sometimes we have to, you know, again find those balances uh, with with some of the local small business owners. But I certainly would very, very, very much encourage you to, you know, really consider adding the bus shelter there to that stop. Um, I, I just I think that's one of those little extra things that's just gonna, you know, here's a good local business look at you know yet another thing that they've done um for the community so um i am happy to entertain a motion if one of my fellow commissioners would like to make one i'll make a motion <clears throat> uh, i move to approve the conditional zoning request uh, for the property located at 990 tunnel road from residential multifamily low density RM6 to office two conditional zone O2CZ with an amendment to the future land use map of the living Asheville comprehensive plan from residential neighborhood to traditional corridor and find that the request is reasonable, is in the public interest, is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan or other adopted plans and meets the development needs of the community in that the request one promotes health and wellness by supporting medical facilities in proximity to neighborhoods, two, encourages responsible growth by prioritizing development in areas targeted for growth, and three, supports the development of an underutilized site. A second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Before I do the roll call vote, Shannon, do we need in any way to um, make mention about the condition about that sidewalk that the the text in at least the project conditions we're looking at is slightly incorrect yeah we can certainly say with the with the correction as noted okay all right so we have the motion in a second with that with knowing that there will be a correction to exhibit e project conditions nine regarding the uh sidewalk um along Maple Springs and Campground Road. Um, all right, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Vice Chair Levi. Aye. Uh, Commissioner uh, Simmons. Aye. Commissioner Faircloth. Um, unfortunately, I'm gonna vote nay on this one. I just, um, I wish the best for the applicants and I appreciate their willingness to to grow the business, I just don't feel comfortable at this level. Thank you. Commissioner Bubenik. Aye. Commissioner Hoke. Aye. Commissioner Barton. Aye. And I will vote aye as well. So the motion passes uh, six to one. Thank you very much, Mr. Sugg. Thank you very much, Mr. Mrs. Cal uh, Mr. And Mrs. White. Um, I wish you the best uh, moving forward on the project. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. You. All right. So moving on, we have one last item on the agenda. It is a request to review a proposed zoning text amendment to Chapter 7 of the Unified Development Ordinance for the purpose of updating the, the bleh, up updating the design review committee membership structure. Planner coordinating review is Shannon Tuck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the commissioners may recall last month that I brought a different text amendment before you. Whoops, I don't know why this <laughs> slideshow keeps wanting to jump ahead. Um, that last month we brought before you a text amendment that was related to the um, ordinance 4855, which was the hotel ordinance that was adopted back in February earlier this year. So um, those changes were more specific to hotel development standards. 
Um, but the uh, six month report to council um, also included a recommendation to change the committee appointment structure of the design review committee. So that hotel amendment back in February included both establishing the overlay district as well as the new overlay development requirements for hotel and came up with a new review process for it. But it also created the new formal design review committee. So design review had previously been performed by our downtown and riverfront commissions respectively, um, depending on the location of the proposed project. And this proposal 48, excuse me, ordinance 4855 actually um, kind of took those functions from those two different commissions and created one single design review committee. And that included, the structure of that included, um, the structure of that committee included uh, representatives of both the downtown commission and the riverfront commission. So just very quickly, it's a nine member committee and the structure as it exists today was that four members are appointed, well, eight members are appointed by council, four from the downtown commission and four from the riverfront commission with that ninth seat to be appointed by the committee, the seated committee members themselves. So the recommendation was to actually change the uh, structure so that the number of appointments from the downtown commission and the riverfront commission is reduced from four to three and then the remaining three seats would be appointed at large by council um, we have shared this revision or this proposed change with both the downtown commission and the riverfront commission um, as well as the design review committee uh, they all support the change. Um, we think that this will help reduce the burden on those commissions uh, to find members that are interested in serving in both capacities. Because right now you have to find four people from the Riverfront Commission and four people from the Downtown Commission who are willing to serve on the Design Review Committee, which effectively operates as a whole separate commission. So you're basically um, serving on two different commissions. Um, the downtown commission does have four seated members the riverfront commission could only come up with three so that's um, kind of helped influence the recommendation that maybe three is a more appropriate number and a more achievable number for those two bodies so the specific code change it looks like this you can see where we strike out that the council is now appointing all nine members with three from the downtown commission and three from the riverfront commission, and then the three who will be selected at large. Um, that ninth member being appointed by the committee itself that gets struck entirely. There are a couple other very small um, cleanup um, revisions um, in the same article, article three, which is the uh, advisory and decision-making bodies section of the UDO. So we have to also update the downtown commission and riverfront commission's responsibilities as it relates to design review. Um, and there are actually some revisions to chapter two, not the UDO, not chapter seven, but chapter two that will also have to be um, uh, revised as part of this. Um, this body, the Plan Zoning Commission, doesn't review amendments to code that is not part of the UDO that's in a different chapter. So that's not being shared with you, but council will have to adopt it later and it will be part of this, um, this proposed ordinance. That concludes my summary. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Tuck. Um, can't say I feel pain for them not or not wanting to serve on two commissions, but that's, you know, <laughs> there's only a few of us that are crazy enough to do that, I guess. Um, I did listen to the uh, DRC uh, meeting from from the other week, and it seemed like they were completely fine with it. And it certainly makes complete sense to me. So um, I don't know if any of my fellow commissioners have any questions or comments they want to make. I mean, this one's a pretty straightforward one. Oh. Um, uh, hi. Um, yeah, go ahead. I'd like to ask. So you mentioned that the one um, about the parking and lodging, even downtown, was going to be a different point. 
at another meeting or something not under our review. Could you repeat that, please? Um, so ordinance 4855 was, you know, what we sort of just informally referred to as the hotel ordinance that was adopted back in February. Um, and after that was adopted, council asked staff to come back after six months with sort of a report on how things are going. So at that six month report, we said, well, we think there's some code changes to the hotel ordinance that are worth pursuing. And we also think uh, shifting the structure of the design review committee makes sense. And council said, that sounds good, please come back. Last month, I shared with you all the revisions to the hotel section of the code. And this month I'm sharing with you the changes for design review committee. So you've already reviewed and supported the changes last month for the hotel stuff. That was, um, you may recall, it was mostly the definitions. Yeah. Um, kind of updating the definitions for hotel and extended stay and that stuff. So those, that's all on its way to city council now. Okay. I just remember that being like back to back, that one project in South Slope and then we had that decision, so yeah. Yeah. Is Miss Tuck is the idea that this that this and the previous last month's um, revisions would go to council at the same time? I guess, or I don't think so. We had up next week, right? Yeah, we we yeah. had discussed um, doing them together as one ordinance, um, but they kind of deal with different subjects. Now, one is really about updating development standards and definitions, and the other is about the structure of the committee. Um, the creation of the design review committee was part of hotel of the hotel ordinance, but it wasn't the main part, I think. Um, so I think we just thought it, it might make more sense to people if we separated them, um, especially because this this particular ordinance also is going to take or is going to require changes to chapter two and the hotel stuff doesn't have anything to do with chapter two well and, and the drc is kind of a standalone thing now that it's been created exactly anyway yeah. so. they may end up on the same night but actually i think they're going to be staggered All right. it looks like the calendar for council says that the the hotel development standards will be on on the 14th but yeah, so this one be on the same night. So okay. December 14th. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um if no one is jumping to make a motion, I certainly will. I don't see anybody jumping to. Um did we open public comment? Oh, thank you. Uh we will <laughs> try to do it again. We will open for public comment at 7:20. Is there anyone? Chair, there are no callers. Okay, great. We will close for public comment at 720. So now I'll do the motion unless someone else is going to jump up and want to make it. But, um, I move to approve the proposed wording amendments to Chapter 7 of the UDO and find that the proposed amendments are reasonable in the public interest and consistent with the city's comprehensive plan and that they one support greater diversity on city boards and commissions two promote great architecture and urban design and three act on a comprehensive study of lodging facilities and their impact by developing new policies for hotel development second uh was that miss levi Ms. Simmons. Oh, Simmons. Sorry, apologize. I couldn't. It was. I probably need to turn up my mic there. Okay. Um, do a roll call vote then. Uh, Commissioner Barton. Aye. Commissioner Hoke. Aye. Commissioner Bubenik. Aye. Commissioner Faircloth. Aye. Vice Chair Levi. Aye. Commissioner Simmons. Aye. And I will vote aye as well. Motion passes unanimously. And so that concludes, <clears throat> excuse me, concludes the agenda of public hearings. The next scheduled meeting for the commission is set for Wednesday, January 5th, 2022. And as always, you can find out more information about the agenda at the commission's website. Um, before we adjourn, I just wanna thank everybody for being here tonight, staff, for all the work that they've done over this year. Certainly, 
in the transition to the virtual meetings, it's definitely gotten a lot better. Um, and definitely want to thank all my commission members, you know, for volunteering your time, which is perfectly in giving or in perfectly in spirit of the season of giving. So thank you all for, you know, being here and showing up and bringing such, you know, great discourse to everything. So very much appreciated. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, staff. Y'all, y'all kick butt. You do great. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. All right. And I'll second that. So all those in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Everybody Thank have a great all. night. Have a good rest of the year and see you next Happy week. Happy holidays. Happy Thank holidays. You. Merry Christmas. Happy, Happy New holidays. Year. Yeah. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye.